Good afternoon. Welcome to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting and Maritime Uses. I am Council Member Adrian Adams, the Chair of this Subcommittee. We are joined today by Council Members Ku and Menchaca. Today we will be holding hearings on a historic district designation, the designation of a fire station and a police station as individual historic landmarks, and two leases of real property by the New York Police Department. The first item we will hear is LU-175, an application submitted by the New York City Police Department and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services for renewal of an existing lease for the acquisition of property located at 700 Columbia Street, Block 612, Lot 250, and part of Lot 205 in Red Hook, Brooklyn. The Police Department has leased this property since 1994 for use as a vehicular evidence storage facility that has a capacity of over 1,700 vehicles. The approval of the original lease was conditioned on the city providing $50,000 a year for the maintenance of the Coffee Street Pier, now known as Valentino Park. When this application was before the City Planning Commission, the NYPD expressed its continuing commitment to fund maintenance of the park through an interagency agreement with the Department of Parks and Recreation. This facility is located in Council Member Menchaca's district. Okay. I'd like to call representatives of the NYPD to testify at this time. and the Parks Department as well. We have Captain Stephen Bonanso, Benuso, Agency Attorney Michael Clark, and Matt Drury okay, from New York City Parks. Before you begin, Council will swear you in. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Okay, you may begin. All right, good afternoon, Chair Adams and members of the council. I'm Captain Stephen Bonuso, the commanding officer of the New York City Police Department's Erie Basin Auto Pound. On behalf of the police commissioner, James P. O'Neill, I am pleased to testify before your committee today about renewing our lease at our current location. The Erie Basin Auto Pound is part of the NYPD Property Clerk Division, which is, which is responsible for handling, catalog, cataloging, safeguarding, and storing property that comes into the possession of the NYPD. The division is taxed, tasked with one of the most important duties of the NYPD, ensuring citizens' property is returned to them promptly and making sure evidence is preserved and produced in court. The Erie Basin Auto Pound is specifically used by the NYPD to store cars which have been towed for reasons other than parking violations. This includes situations where the vehicle's operator has been arrested or where the vehicle has been seized because it is evidence or the instrumentality of a crime. In 2017, we had 4,175 4, vehicles and motorcycles stored in the facility. Currently, there are approximately 2,700 vehicles on site. We are staffed by 32 NYPD employees. The Erie Basin Auto Pound is always open, the, through the, though the public may, o, may only retrieve vehicles on Monday to Friday from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. In 2017, 1,140 civilians visited the facility to retrieve their vehicles. There is no existing space in New York City which will meet our needs if we were forced to relocate. At 947,034 square feet, this facility is massive. With space in the city in dwindling supply, we cannot find another space to store this evidence. Not approving this lease would significantly impact the operations of the department. Under the previous lease, the NYPD provided $50,000 for the maintenance of the Lewis Valentino Jr. Pier, Park and Pier. I am pleased to say that we are committed to, we are committed to continuing to provide that money should this lease be approved. These funds have been utilized by the Parks Department towards the course of a full-time city park worker, or CPW, to provide maintenance and operational support for the park as part of a larger mobile crew. This maintenance approach has helped ensure that it is consistently one of the highest ranked parks in the city, and we, and we look forward to continuing to work with our colleagues in the Parks Department. Thank you for letting me testify today. My colleagues and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. 
Thank you, Captain. Anyone else? Okay, at this time, I would like to recognize my colleague, Council Member Menchaca, for your questions and remarks. Thank you, thank you, Chair, uh, and uh, thank you for coming and presenting today. There are uh, a few things I wanna just kind of highlight and then maybe ask a few questions as we move forward. Um, but the first thing I wanna say is, is just thank you for, for your continued cooperation as we continue to understand more and more about what, uh, what we have in front of us. Uh, this is, we're, we're in a kind of land use review process right now, uh, and one of the great things about a public hearing like this is that we get to understand it in its entirety, uh, and I as the local representative for the district uh, am really representing the people's voice and trying to understand uh, their needs in this conversation and how we can work together. One of the great things about this particular application is that there are multiple agencies working in tandem. Uh, when you first look at it, you're like, hey, NYPD is working with the Parks Department, then you have DCAS who's doing the leases. Uh, in a recent meeting, we had all those agencies, including the Mayor's Office, our Land Use Central, uh, and, uh, and my, my district staff. What that said to me was the power of collaboration, the power of coalition, and how great that the history of this park, and I'm gonna read some prepared statements, really were born out of that cooperation that started 20 years ago. And that's what we're trying to honor today. That initial commitment, the history of the neighborhood, and how we can move forward in a more transparent and uh, accountable way. That's our work and role today. And so, thank you for your willingness to co collaborate. We are considering an agreement with a private property owner in Red Hook. And as you know, as we all understand, this agreement would allow the NYPD to continue its operations of an evidence and vehicle storage facility on the Erie, Erie Basin, Breakwater, and Red Hook. I will add in this note that we are essentially extending another, a lease of 10 years. And what I wanna, I wanna hint to you now is that I think that this might be the last 10 years that I see the city wanting to do such a thing at this location and that the idea of, of of a new use, a use that brings more waterfront access to the community and other amenities of the neighborhood through a planning process might yield, this might be the last time that the city, I think, should approve such a thing. And what a beautiful thing that we can do that at the front end of a lease and work with NYPD to plan this out so that we can not be at a pressure point uh, like we find ourselves today. My role in this process is to reflect the voice of the Red Hook community, so I'm going to do that Today, not everyone knows the history of the current agreement between the NYPD and the Erie Basin Marine Associates, but there is an important history, one that many of our constituents know intimately. In the mid-1990s, when this agreement was first contemplated, New York City and Red Hook were very different places. Red Hook res residents built a vibrant community without adequate public investment or resources. In fact, we continue to do that building today. Transportation and food access were, as they continue to be, substandard, and waterfront access was non-existent. It was in this context that NYPD identified the Erie Basin breakwater as a preferred site for vehicle and evidence storage, a large parking lot and a warehouse. And at that time, almost everyone said no. The local council member said no. The state assembly member and state senate member said no. The community group said no. They said no because of a massive investment um, a massive investment in an, into an NYPD facility was an inappropriate at the time in a neighborhood where residents and had legitimate needs that were being ignored. And as a result of the significant opposition, a compromise was found. This lease would then be predicated on a significant investment into public waterfront access in Red Hook. The first investment was an ongoing payment of $50,000, as you mentioned, and each year to maintain the yet-to-be-built park at the end of Coffee Street. This park we now know as Louis Valentino Jr. Park and Pier, and it's had major success. How many of you, just by raise your hands, have been to Valentino Pier Park in Red Hook? Raise your hands. You're missing out. You're missing out. Just then you know now. It's really beautiful. It's a really, really beautiful park, and you should go. Um, this original planning commission, uh, let's see, Okay, stunning, unique place where you can see the Statue of Liberty. It's beautiful, that's absolutely gorgeous. And this original planning commission approval also called for another critical component of Red Hook's 
waterfront access, the Columbia Street Esplanade. And these are the documents that we've all been sharing. I'm really thankful that we've had great and transparent uh, process. Built in the mid-1990s as a result of this lease agreement, this esplanade remains a vital, though anemic, public amenity. These public assets were central to the rationale behind Planning Commission's approval in 1993, and they continue to be central to mine. So all I'm saying in this public hearing, uh, and there are probably members that may, may have come in, but we're collecting testimony right now from our community. I do not imagine me approving this lease until we are all on the same page as we understand how we can, can, can continue to commit to that original purpose of public access, not just for Valentino, but for the Columbia, uh, the Columbia Street Esplanade. This is an opportunity to come back to the community after we're done. We have a few more weeks before you will see an approval in front of you, and I hope that we can continue the spirit of collaboration and problem solving. That is my commitment to you. If we can all come together and, and come back to the community with the multiple faces of all the agencies and say we have a good plan, uh, I will feel comfortable approving this. Some of the things that I think I I, we want to see is a document that outlives, as we are now looking at our old documents, outlives us. None of us, I believe, will be around, well, I don't know, 10 years maybe is not too long ago. But I know I won't be a council member in 10 years. And so therefore, we're going to need something uh, ironclad, clear, transparent. We can go back to the community and say, this is our commitment. And there are other things that we're going to have to talk about, like planning for the future use of this spot and whether that makes sense in the future. Let's start now, 10 years in advance, not 10 months in advance. And so with that, um, I think the only questions I have are, have, have you uh, considered new investments for the park as we discussed, and how we can bring um, a sense of equity to a $50,000 initial allocation for maintenance of a park to 2018 numbers? And so maybe that's the first question that I'll, like how are you thinking about that uh, as, as we all kind of look at these things together? Sorry, Matt Jury, Parks Department. I think I would characterize that uh, the Parks Department uh, sort of care and maintenance of the space has been quite considerable, sort of above and beyond, you know, the, the sort of initial conversations, commitments that came out of that Mueller process starting in 1993. Having said that, I think we're always open uh, to, you know, further conversations about specific needs that the park may have. As you've noticed, uh, as, as, as you noted, uh, it's extremely popular, uh, you know, well received by the, by the immediate community and also, you know, something of a destination uh, writ large. Um, I will note uh, it received two allocations of capital improvements over the last uh, uh, several years, uh, totaling about $600,000. So for what it's worth, the agency feel, you know, has and will continue to invest uh, in, in, the, in the pier and park uh, as, a, as the important resource that it is. And what about the Columbia uh, Street Esplanade? Uh, that's currently under the, Karen, I'll defer to my colleagues here. Yeah, I mean, I think right now under the lease agreement and the lease agreement going forward, the esplanade is under our care and we, we're responsible for the maintenance and upkeep of that. Um, you know, we, if there's anything you're looking for improvements, we can talk to you about it. Um, but we, the, the upkeeping care is on, on our shoulders. Um, so we, we definitely do that and we're willing to work with you on, on how to improve that. Okay, and I think this is a gr great time to kind of point to not just like taking care of a bench now because it's broken, but more about a long-term 10-year commitment that we can go back to the community and say, this is, this is how we're going to work together. This is how we're going to see investment play out over 10 years, not just an initial moment where we have leverage right now um, as a city council. So I'm, I'm hoping that in the next few weeks we can kind of design something that makes sense, that's equitable, but also can outlast uh, an initial and immediate conversation. This isn't about more uh, bulbs, daffodil bulbs um, in, in Valentino. This is about a long-term commitment that everybody signs and as we approve through pub this public process can be held accountable. And so, so I'm not just looking for immediate, and we can, we can bring you some of those immediate items. This is about longevity of a document that will outlive us. 
what else? Um, MOU, I believe, is being constructed. Yeah, I talk think a little bit about that and what we can expect soon. Yeah, I think we're in the middle of drafting it and negotiating it. Uh, I don't know who has it at the moment. Um, can you talk just in general? What's an MOU for you in this case? What does it mean? What is it? What is it going to do for us? Right. So the, the, a memorandum of understanding is an agreement between two agencies. It's sort of like a contract where we, you know, agree uh, since there is joint efforts on the Valentino Pier just so we put on what we're responsible for and what the Parks Department is responsible for. Um, and like we said, we're committed to keeping the $50,000 uh, going forward. Um, if there's anything else that needs to happen, you know, we'll talk to the mayor's office about uh, how, to, how to address those needs. Um, but then it would also describe the Parks Department's responsibilities with the, mo with the money. Um, that, yeah. 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 I think that okay. sums it up quite well. And maybe final question. Uh, I know some other members are here for, for their pieces. Uh, so listening to me say very open and publicly that, that this, these might be the last 10 years uh, probably doesn't feel good necessarily because that means that we're going to have to change a use and a, a facility that I think I said at the very beginning, I know is integral into what and how the NYPD does what they do. And I wanted to make sure that you continue to do that. And because I care about the facility itself and what it means to the NYPD as a storage facility, I want to make sure that it has its longevity, which is insert planning. How would the NYPD take this now and start the planning process today? What, what would it look like? Can you point to something that we can look at? And in a very similar way, whether you had local community planning visioning that said, hey, NYPD, you're going to move out soon. Let's start talking about it and have an open discussion about where you can go, plan it out in another neighborhood. Maybe it's in Red Hook, but somewhere else. How would you do that? And can you just give us a sense about how, how, you're, how you'll take that? I mean, I think it's hard to say exactly how we'd uh, react or plan today for what we might need in 10 years. Um, you know, the, the city is changing every day. So what spaces might be available in 10 years, I, we don't know today. So it's... You know, it's obviously it's an extensive process. If we were to move this facility, um, we'd have to find somewhere. Uh, but I, I can I couldn't tell you today what we have to do to make that happen ten years from now. Do you have a planning team at the NYPD, like a, a group of planners? I believe so. Yeah. You believe so? Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Let's talk to them and just organize a little bit, um, because there's nothing stopping us now from saying, you know what, we're done, and we can now start planning. If if there's not a leg. Um, I think more time is good. That's all I'm saying. And it sounds like you have a team that we can work with to start planning that out so that everyone's good and happy and can anticipate change uh, and work together. Okay. Okay. I think that's it for me, Chair. Thank you so much for, for the generous time. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. And uh, just to echo uh, my colleagues' sentiments, and thank you very much for presenting that. Um, my hope is that, um, that you will come to an agreeable um, uh, stance when it comes to this particular uh, property and this area. Uh, I haven't seen Valentino Park, but I will. Uh, so <laughs> I, I will, I will. And, and our hope uh, is that long term, that it really is shared and celebrated by this community that deserves it so very much, as you also deserve storage space as well, so we all support each other in our future endeavors to make sure that everybody is taken care of in this instance. So thank you again, panel, and thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any more uh, witnesses from the public that wish to testify on this uh, particular item? Sir? Please step up. Okay, not for this particular item. Okay, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on LU-175. I'd like to note that we have been joined by council members Traeger and Barron. Our next hearing 
is on LU-176, another application submitted by the New York City Police Department and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services for the site selection and acquisition of property located at 241 West 26th Street, Block 776, Lot 12, to facilitate the conversion of an existing six-story, 34,213 square foot building to house the headquarters of the NYPD Bomb Squad, currently operating in the NYPD 6th Precinct at 233 West 10th Street. This property is located in the Speaker's District in Manhattan, and I now invite the representatives of the NYPD to testify on this application. Council will swear you in at this time. Please state your names. I am uh, Lieutenant Mark Torrey of the NYPD Bomb Squad. Please raise your right hand. Do you do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? I do. And uh, Michael Clark from NYPD will give you a Thank you. You may begin. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Adams and members of the council. I am Lieutenant Mark Torrey, commanding officer of the NYPD Bomb Squad. And on behalf of Police Commissioner James P. O'Neill, I am pleased to testify before your committee today on the relocation of the NYPD Bomb Squad's headquarters. The NYPD Bomb Squad is currently staffed by 39 uniformed members of the service, all of whom are federally certified hazardous device or colloquially speaking bomb technicians. Fifteen of those have the additional designation of explosive detection canine handlers. Uh, the Bomb Squad's main uh, responsibility is to investigate and mitigate suspicious packages, articles, devices, and potentially explosive substances. In addition, we conduct security sweeps for visiting dignitaries and large public events. The bomb squad has been located in the 6th Precinct since 1978. At that time, there were 12 uniformed members of the service assigned to the squad. Unfortunately, the increased threat levels, including suspicious packages, since the terrorist attacks of 9-11, have necessitated an increase in our headcount. Additionally, the equipment necessary to be uh, to, to continue operations as a state-of-the-art bomb squad has expanded in scope, complexity, and most importantly, size or volume. Sadly, our space in the 6th Precinct has remained fixed. For our expensive equipment to be of maximum value, it needs to be uh, maintained in an enclosed climate-controlled garage uh, facility located on site. Currently, we are forced to park certain sensitive equipment outdoors, exposing it to extremes of heat and cold, and leaving other equipment at a remote facility that adds precious minutes at times to our, to our uh, uh, response time. With no ability to expand our current location, we have been forced to seek new space. This has been a significant challenge, since it's imperative that we remain in Manhattan, where most of our suspicious package responses take place, and where there is the greatest concentration of potential targets. From Times Square and in, uh, in and, <clears throat> excuse me, from Times Square and the Empire State Building in Midtown to the World Trade Center and New York Stock Exchange in downtown, the bomb squad must be able to respond quickly to potential threats. Thus, remaining in close proximity to these high-profile targets is vital. Space in Manhattan it can, that can accommodate our staff, our equipment, and our kennels is limited, but we were fortunate to find a location on West 26th Street that is capable of meeting those needs. Now, I know there have been a few concerns about moving into this space, and I'd like to take a moment to address them. First and foremost, and I must underscore this, we will never bring any potentially explosive device back to our base of operations on 26th Street. We will follow our long-standing practice of bringing any explosive not neutralized at the scene of an incident to Rodman's Neck, where we can safely investigate a bomb and perform what we call a render safe procedure on the device. This is a, the exact procedure that was followed during the Chelsea bombing of September 2016, you may recall. Uh, moreover, we will not publicly mark our location, uh, presence at this location. Secondly, we are aware that residents are concerned with potential noise coming from the location. However, the bomb squad, unlike a traditional police precinct, has a limited number of emergency deployments in any given month, significantly reducing any noise that our operations may cause. I'd like to note that 
my time of association with the bomb squad goes back to 1993, and we've never had any type of noise complaint generated by uh, virtue of bomb squad activities. In addition, we will continue to current, uh, follow our current protocol where sirens are not activated on an emergency response until we have cleared the block. Finally, we understand that there have been concerns raised about potential disruptions to the bike lane located on West 26th Street. This proposed location is on the north side of the street, while the recently installed bike lane is on the south side of the street. Our vehicles should rarely, if ever, cross into the bike lane when entering or exiting our location. While it is unfortunate that we find ourselves in a time where a municipal police force is required to maintain technical experts, dogs, robots, and equipment to safeguard our city and its, its inhabitants from a potentially explosive attack, it is nevertheless a necessity based on reality. We therefore ask for your support in enhancing our ability to most effectively respond to this critical threat. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My colleagues and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Lieutenant. Uh, just for the record, uh, can you just answer um, the amount of staffing or headcount in any day of officers at this location? So, ma'am, uh, on any given day, the, the officers rotate in shifts. And we typically have anywhere from, depending on time of day, a minimum of five to a maximum of eight to 12 that would be performing duty at that particular time. But average, really the average would be five or six at any given time of day. So truly it is not uh, the volume of personnel that it would be at your typical precinct. Or yes, something. they're not all working at the same time, so substantially insignificant compared to a typical police precinct. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in general, how many responses does the NYPD bomb squad make in a month or a year? Even? So in, in terms of what we would call an emergency response, um, that's where a suspicious package has been located, identified, and, and our services are requested. That averages out to about 10 to 12 times a month. Now, our other duties, our additional duties, um, they, they actually, um, the amount of runs, if you will, generated where we take a, a responding number, if you will, that can be over 1,000. However, those responses, one exiting the building one time, for instance, to perform a security sweep, Think of the UN, that's a high volume time of year. We might send a team out, they'll leave the building, perform five or even 10 security sweeps on the outside, and then come back. So one, enter, one exiting, one entrance is responsible for 10 runs. So the, the amount of assignment numbers is not necessarily reflective of a response. In addition, we do have a remote facility. You're familiar with the police firing range in the Bronx. Uh, we, we handle those types of non-emergency situa situations, oftentimes baseball games, sporting events, parades. Those are handled out of the Bronx location. It has nothing to do with our, our Manhattan location. But I think that the key, the crux of your question is the emergency responses, where we're, we're leaving that building and we're going out to a job. That's 10 or 12 times a month. Okay. Thank you, Lieutenant. Um, Lieutenant, in the event of an emergency call during late hours, how will quality of life issues be addressed for the residents of the area um, so not as to be disruptive as far as sirens and lights and such? So uh, I'll stipulate that um, they, that block will not see any increase to emergency traffic noise, if you will, than they are seeing right now. Because right now we have ambulances and fire trucks and of course police vehicles that are traversing that block while, while they're on the way from point A to B. Um, our footprint in that regard, uh, ma'am, we'll, I'll stipulate that it'll be non-existent because we do have a standing policy. We are currently located again on, in the 6th Precinct. The garage exits onto Charles Street. Uh, when our vehicles leave, we're about mid-block. Um, there are a lot of residents there, and I'm going to add that the residents really do love us. We have a, quite a good relationship with the community. Um, there are ways to maintain that relationship, and one of them is when we have to exit the block on an emergency run, we, we just have a standing policy, no sirens until you reach Hudson Street. Um, and it, it's, it's not a hard policy to follow. We just have to wait for the traffic light to change. Of course, uh, lights are activated, and that people will leave the block under, under seeing the lights of a police truck behind them. But we have no need to, to activate a siren on the block. As soon as we hit 8th Avenue and Hudson, uh, that, that's when a siren is util utilized if necessary. 
Okay, I know the residents will be happy about that. Um, on another line, um, I have a background with community board, um, as being a chairperson of the community board for a number of years. Um, there have been some c concerns uh, from the community board related to traffic uh, along West 26th Street. So my question is, has the NYPD and or DCAS uh, addressed the concerns of the community board when it comes to traffic um, or possibility of traffic increase because of this application? Yeah, we, you know, we, we, uh, we currently think this will end up being a traffic net reduction. Uh, you know, right now it's a 255 person or car garage that will become, you know, uh, however often the bomb squad is going out, which is less than 200 cars going in and out. Uh, so we, you know, we, when we looked at the, uh, the standards on the city environmental quality review, we don't, it doesn't say we had to do a traffic study, but we did look at the issue um, and we're considering it and we'll work with, do what we can to work with community to minimize the disruption that will, any that's caused, but we think this actually will be a net reduction of traffic because you know our vehicles aren't going in you know 10 to 12 emergencies a month and then the other things that happen you know it's not it's not a it's not like a fire department that's coming out multiple runs a day or police department multiple runs a day that's not the nature of the bomb squad's work so we think that'll be actually a net, net reduction okay and i just have one last question before i go to my colleagues uh with regard to um the bike lane the new bike lane um, that's been installed along West 26th Street. Um, has, has an environmental analysis been re revised uh, to assess traffic conditions with this new addition as well? Uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, oh, you have the camera maybe with the mic, I'm not, okay. I, I'm not aware of that, I mean, this is pretty, pretty new, but we, you know, we'll consider it as we go forward and we, uh, again, wanna be, good, Bomb Squad prides itself on being good neighbors and will continue to be good neighbors. So, um, it, you know, I think the bike lane, you know, it, whatever it does to traffic, it doesn't change the fact that we're ch taking 255 car garage and making it a much smaller amount of runs from our Bomb Squad. So even with that, we still think it'll be a net reduction. Okay, our recommendation would be, of course, to make sure um, that, that that assessment is done um, to ensure the safety of uh, the bikers using that bike lane. Right, and, well. we, and because it's on the south side of the street, we don't anticipate that our, the cars will actually ever cross it. Mm -hmm. So in terms of biker safety, it shouldn't be, you know, our, our anticipation that it won't be affecting the biker safety. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Council Member Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just have a couple of questions. The project site is presently occupied by a six-story building. I believe so, something, something like that. Uh, so it indicates in the notes that are here that there's a parking facility that's presently there. Yes. And that your project calls for utilizing the first and second floor of the structure for parking. Right, but I think that'd be parking our vehicles. For your, for your vehicles, right. right. So you anticipate that that projected space will meet your needs we don't want to have to come back another five years from now and see that there's a projected need now because of uh, some increase. It will meet your needs as it currently exists and your plans for the future, five, 10 years, will be accommodated in this one space? Yes, ma'am. Uh, this space represents a, a, a significant improvement is an understatement, quite frankly. Um, I cannot conceive of needing to move to a, an additional location after this. this. This is a monumental improvement for us. And I'm always concerned about the residents, current residents of any project that we're talking about. So do you have any information as to what their plans are or have they secured uh, new quarters for their businesses? Because they will be displaced. So do you have any information as to the status of their search for new headquarters for their businesses? Good afternoon, my name is Jason Ortiz and I'm with DCAS. Thank you. Uh, council will swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and answer to all, sub, uh, all council member questions? 
Yes. Thank you. You may begin. Right. So the information that I have says that there's a fire prevention business and a ground, uh, a dry cleaners also are indicated as two of the businesses. Do you have any update as to what their status is? The landlord owns the fire pre uh, prevention uh, business, okay. so he will relocate that at his discretion. Mm -hmm. uh, the dry cleaner has been offered the opportunity to relocate across the street at another landlord-owned building, so they are now working out the details on that uh, move. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman Barron. Thank you very much, panel. Um, for your testimony today, are there any more members of the public who wish to testify with regard to this application? All right, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on LU-176. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the next two items we will hear are two individual landmarks located in Council Member Donovan Richards District. The first of these is LU 152, the Landmarks Preservation Commission's designation of the firehouse for engine companies 264 and 328 and ladder company 134, located at 16-15 Central Avenue in Rockaway, Queens as a historic landmark. The second of these items is LU-153, the Landmark Preservation Commission's designation of the 53rd Street Precinct Police Station located at 16-12 Mott Avenue in Far Rockaway, Queens as a historic landmark. And I now call on LPC to testify on both of these designations and then we will take testimony from the public. Um, Kate McHale, LPC. Ali Rasunajad. LPC. Okay, and Stephen Reiner from NYPD. Here, okay. Council, please swear in the panel. Please state your names. Stephen Reinert, architect with uh, NYPD. Michael Clark, the agency attorney at uh, NYPD. Kate Lewis McHale, Landmarks Preservation Commission. Uh, Ali Rasulinajad, LPC. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee in response to all council member questions? I do. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Adams and subcommittee members. I'm Kate Lemus McHale, Director of Research at LPC. I'm joined by Ali Raslanajad to present these two designations. On May 29th, 2018, the Landmarks Preservation Commission designated Engine Company 236 and 328, Hook and Ladder 134 Firehouse, and the 53rd, now 101st Precinct Police Station in downtown Far Rockaway as individual landmarks. I have a little background on both buildings, which I'll just present to you now, and then we'll get into the police precinct. Okay. Um, Kate, can you speak more directly into oh, the yeah, microphone, sorry. please? We're having a hard time hearing you. Uh, 
Um, at the public hearing on April 24th, two people testified in favor of the designation of these buildings, including representatives of Council Member Donovan Richards and the Historic Districts Council. The fire department supported designation and the police department did not oppose designation. These properties were identified as historic preservation opportunities within a proposed rezoning uh, of the downtown Rockaway area shown in the dashed outline on your screen with uh, the downtown Far Rockaway redevelopment project led by EDC, which has among its goals improvements to public space, strengthening existing commercial corridors, and expanding community services and cultural assets. Far Rockaway is the easternmost community in New York City um, on the Rockaway Peninsula bordering Nassau County. Although its history as a seaside resort reaches back to the 1830s, it began in earnest with the arrival of the railroad in 1869, which led to the further construction of summer hotels and boarding houses. In 1880, a railroad trestle constructed across Jamaica Bay linked the Rockaways directly with Queens, leading many residents to build their own summer cottages there. After this line was electrified in the early 20th century, some of these residents decided to stay in Far Rockaway year-round and commute to their jobs from there. Far Rockaway, along with the rest of present-day Queens, became part of New York City in 1898. The construction of new civic buildings there in the early 20th century coincided with a boom in its year-round population and cemented its connection to the rest of the city. Far Rockaway remains a quiet, largely low-rise community, and these buildings are both significant reminders of a crucial era in its development history and prominent historic structures in the streetscape. The engine company's 264 and 328 Ladder Company 134 Firehouse is a three-story firehouse constructed in 1910 to 12 to address a paucity of fire protection for the growing community of Far Rockaway. Designed by architectural firm Hoppen and Cohn, well-known designers of firehouses and police stations in New York City. The building is located on Central Avenue, north of Mott Avenue. It sits at the northern end of a large rectangular lot that includes a one-story public library built in the 1960s um, at the south end and a parking lot in the center. The landmark site is shown here and includes just the firehouse itself. The firehouse's Renaissance Revival style facade is a three bay version of a standardized modular design devised by Hoppen and Cohn that was used at 18 locations um, in either one, two, or three bay iterations. Engine company 264 is shown on the right was the one of only three built in the larger uh, three bay wide facade. And these are um, some models that were found at the Public Design Commission when they were approved. This was the first construction campaign by the fire department that used a standardized facade design that could be customized to fit particular sites. According to the Brooklyn Eagle at the time, the greatest celebration in the history of the Rockaways was held at the opening of this firehouse in 1913. That celebration is shown on the left, and the right is the firehouse in the 1960s. The building features Renaissance-inspired detailing, such as its rusticated base, paired double-height pilasters, a cast stone rondelle with the seal of the fire department, and a stone cornice. In the Far Rockaway community, the firehouse is affectionately known as the Big House. It serves as a reminder of the period of growth and promise in the years after consolidation of New York City. The 53rd, now 101st, Precinct Police Station is an impressive civic structure in the Rockaways. Completed by early 1929, this building replaced the neighborhood's dilapidated former precinct house with a dignified stately structure reflecting its importance, uh, important community role in the prosperity of the city that constructed it. It was the first police station built by the city of New York in the Rockaways. The 53rd Precinct Police Station was built as part of a program initiated by Commissioner Richard E. Enright to modernize, motorize, and stabilize the department. It was designed by Thomas E. O'Brien, who had joined the police department as a patrolman in 1890 and became its superintendent of buildings in 1923. 
As head architect, O'Brien designed several new police stations as part of Commissioner Enright's building campaign. The 53rd Precinct Police Station is located four blocks east of the Far Rockaway train station at the corner of Mott Avenue and S Scott A. Goodell Place. The three-story building has two fully developed facades and recalls an Italian Renaissance palazzo featuring a rusticated ground story with round arch openings crowned by stepped arches, classical window surrounds, um, coining, and a deep molded cornice. A two-story garage adjoining the station house reflects the increasing importance of motor vehicles to patrol work in the 1920s. Little change from the time of its opening, the 53rd, now 101st Precinct Police Station remains one of Far Rockaway's most prominent buildings, as well as a significant link to a crucial period in the neighborhood's development when new civic, educational, transportation, and recreational facilities heralded Far Rockaway's emergence as a year-round community and cemented its connection to New York City. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my question and uh, Councilmember Richard's question as well has to do with the uh, ADA accessibility issue with the police precinct. Can you please address that? Sure. Yes, we had some conversations with the police department leading up to this designation to talk about what it would mean to be a landmark and any uh, projects that they have. We understand that they are committed to construct an ADA ramp at this uh, property, and they're in a process of onboarding consultants to do that. And we plan to meet with them within the month to discuss their plans. Yeah, as soon as we have our consultant on board, we'll meet with uh, LPC to make sure that the plans you know, meet their requirements so we can get it done. Okay, and you said that was going to be within a month? You're gonna work with the consultant or? We're hoping to have our consultant on board within the month, and then we want our consultant to be at that meeting. Um, so, you know, obviously he or she can hear what LPC has to say, um, and we expect that to be in the month. And we, sure, as soon as they're on board, we'll set up the meeting. Um, but it should be, I mean, not end of August, but 30 or so days. Um, okay. That's, that's our hope. Okay. That, that was the question that was hanging in the air. Thank okay. you. Councilmember Barron, did you have any questions? Yes, thank you. So how would you meet the requirements for ADA and not violate the requirements of landmark status, which I believe says you keep the facade as is? How do you plan to address that issue? The Landmarks Commission regularly approves ramps and, and different means of making historic buildings accessible. So there are ways of designing something that works with the existing architecture that could be symmetrical um, and that doesn't impact historic fabric. So here it's in a central entrance location on the primary facade. So we would look at ways to minimize an impact to, to the stone base and to the area where it would um, interact with the the facade. So in addition, that's interesting, thank you, and I'm glad to know that you have that accommodation. In addition to ADA modifications, what other modifications does Landmarks approve? Well, we look at any proposed changes that owners uh, need to make to their building, so whether it's window replacement or um, changes for public window safety. or what else? I didn't I didn't hear you. You said window Sorry, replacement. Window replacement, uh, door replacement, repair. Um, you know, this is an overhanging cornice. If there was any work on that, uh, mechanical equipment, etc. Okay, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Thank you very much, panel. Are there any members of the public who wish to testify on any of these items? Seeing none, I now close the public hearings on LUs 152 and 153. Thank you very much. Thank you. The last item on today's agenda is LU 151, the Landmark Preservation Commission's designation of the Central Harlem West 130th through 132nd Streets Historic District. The Historic District consists of approximately 164 properties, primarily row houses located on West 130th, West 131st and West 132nd Streets between Lenox and 7th Avenues. This historic district is in Councilmember Perkins' district. 
Representatives of the Landmarks Preservation Commission will testify on this item, followed by testimony by the public. And I now open uh, public hearings on LU 5154. Okay, panel is still in place. You may begin. Uh, 151, I'm sorry. One five. Uh, on May 29, 2018, the Landmarks Preservation Commission voted unanimously to approve the designation of the Central Harlem West 130th to 132nd Streets Historic District. Constructed during the speculative building boom that created Central Harlem's row house neighborhoods in the late 19th century, the district is highly intact and reflects both the architectural development of Harlem and also the rich social, cultural, and political life of Harlem's African American <coughs> community in the 20th century. The historic district consists of approximately 164 buildings stretching from West 130th to West 132nd Street between Lenox and 7th Avenue. As I will discuss, the boundaries were drawn to include the most cohesive mid-block streetscapes. I will take you through the architectural analysis supporting the designation of this district, followed by a summary of its incredible cultural significance. Much of Harlem above 125th Street experienced rapid development in the final decades of the 19th century as transportation and infrastructure improvements made it an attractive neighborhood for New Yorkers looking to escape the overcrowding of Lower Manhattan. Speculative builders and architects filled the nearly empty blocks seen here in 1879 on the left, and in just over a decade, nearly all of the buildings contained within the proposed district had been built. Today, the district contains almost exclusively 19th century architecture, with only 12 new buildings, all built since 2000. These 12 buildings, along with four unimproved lots and a community garden, are the only non-contributing properties within the district. The nearly 150 contributing buildings within the district have consistency in building age and development history, and also have a high level of integrity or intactness as you can see here by the buildings coded in green, which are those that are intact, with yellow on the map being moderately altered. And by moderately altered, we mean the removal or alteration to a, to a feature of the facade, like a cornice or a stoop being removed. The area's few new buildings, which while not part of the historical significance of the district, are generally of a scale and character that is compatible with the historic architecture. They are considered non-contributing, as are the four vacant lots and a community garden. All of these lots are located within the mid-block and couldn't easily be carved out of the district. Most are single uh, width lots, and in these locations, the commission would be able to ensure that new development is contextually designed and maintain a sense of place along the mid-blocks. Overall, the district's streetscapes are a cohesive collection of late 19th century row house architectural styles, including rows of neo greek Queen Anne, and Revival style buildings, all in a consistent palette of brick and brownstone. When the building styles are mapped, as seen here, the predominance of the neo greek style, which is shown in yellow, uh, becomes clear with clusters of Renaissance Revival and Queen Anne style buildings interspersed. Looking at building typology, the district is predominantly residential, consisting mostly of row houses with some apartment buildings, one with the commercial ground floor on West 132nd Street, a former stable, and churches. At the Landmarks Commission's public hearing on April 17th, owners of this former stable building, which is now operated as a garage, opposed its inclusion within the district. Commission staff met with these owners on two occasions to hear their concerns and discuss what designation would mean for them. In response to public testimony, the commission heard additional analysis of this building, which informed its vote to include it within the district. And I wanted to share that analysis with you briefly. Originally constructed in 1889 as a stable, the structure was built during the primary period of development of the district. It was designed by Julius F. Munkowitz, who worked in the office of Calvert Vox, and later served as architect to the Parks Commission, where he was involved in designs for Central Park and Morningside Park. This building was converted to a garage by 1914, 
and was expanded to include its three easternmost bays, which blend seamlessly with the original 1889 design. 1889. While the facade has been painted black, masking the color and texture of the original brick, this is reversible and it is otherwise very intact. The boundaries of the district were drawn to encompass the 19th century development of central Harlem and include all buildings that face the mid block. Only vacant locks along the edges of the district and buildings that communicate directly with the avenues were omitted. This 1889 building, which is shown here on the left, completes the streetscape of West 132nd Street, which because of the presence of apartment buildings as well as row houses, is somewhat more varied in height and scale than the blocks to the south. The building retains a high level of integrity and contributes to the historic character of the district in terms of its age, materials, and design. As the block developed in the 1880s and 1890s, builders and developers started to move away from row houses and instead erected tenements and service buildings. The simultaneous construction of the stable with the four Queen Anne style brick tenements just two buildings down illustrates this change in context. Now I would like to talk about uh, the district's very rich cultural history which relates to 100 years of African American history, including significant movements from the Harlem Renaissance to the Civil Rights Movement. While the first residents of these row houses were predominantly white and middle class, after the turn of the century, New York City's African American population increased, and many began to rent and purchase homes in Harlem and within the district. These row houses were often adapted for other uses, and within the district, a number of buildings have significant ties to cultural uses the benefit societies and cooperatives of the 1920s and 30s, and to the civil rights movement of the 1960s. As illustrated in this 1933 map, the area of the historic district reflected that layering of social, cultural, and artistic uses, particularly pertaining to music, dance, and theater, that were densely in integrated into this residential neighborhood. Composer Scott Joplin achieved fame for his unique ragtime compositions and was dubbed the king of ragtime. At the time of his death, he resided at 163 West 131st Street in the district. The New Amsterdam Musical Association, or NAMA, which is located on West 130th Street, is the oldest African-American musical association in the United States. It was founded in 1904 in response to African-American musicians being denied admission into white-only local unions. NAMA purchased 107 West 130th Street in 1922, and the bu building continues to serve as the organization's headquarters. NAMA has had many important composers and musicians among its members. James Herbert U.B. Blake, for example, was a long-standing member and for a time resided at NAMA's headquarters. Yubi Blake was one of the most important figures in early 20th century African American music, in particular ragtime and early jazz music and culture, and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1981. Theater production was an important part of the culture of Harlem. Due to the proximity of the Lafayette Theater, many African American actors, actresses, theater musicians, uh, lived throughout the, th throughout the district and were particularly concentrated on West 132nd Street. Workers, performers, philanthropists, and prof professionals organized to meet the needs of a community that faced constant de facto segregation and was strictly excluded from the professional, cultural, political, and social white-only groups in Manhattan. In central Harlem, mutual aid societies, fraternal organizations, and cooperatives provided direct services to their members and served as networking and support systems for African American doctors, lawyers, actors, politicians, and business owners. These societies provided the networks and structure that were key to galvanizing the community for more overt political work of the boycotts, rallies, and marches of the 50s and 60s, and set the stage for the civil rights movement. This historic district has strong ties to that movement and to the March on Washington in particular. Churches and religious leadership played an in integral role in the civil rights movement. Within the district, Friendship Baptist Church on 131st Street was actively involved in mobilizing its membership to support the fight for civil rights. Church leadership had a close relationship with Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., who gave a sermon here in 1955, and the church was used as a base for organizing and galvanizing support for the March on Washington and other events. 
under the leadership of former pastor Dr. Thomas Kilgore Jr., shown on the right, and in the center next to Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., the church owned and operated the Friendship House at 170 West 130th Street, which housed educational, recreational, and cultural centers, and later the headquarters for the March on Washington. In 1963, 170 West 130th Street was used as a national headquarters for the March on Washington. Bayard Rustin, pictured here, who was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by, by President Obama, was the chief organizer. And from this building organized the march, which remains the nation's largest political demonstration and has a measurable national significance. Earlier in its history, the building housed the Utopia Neighborhood Club and Utopia Children's House, significant community institutions. And the architect of its facade, Werner Tandy, Tandy was the first African-American architect registered in New York State. This district was among priorities for designation presented to LPC by Community Board 10 and Save Harlem Now after considerable owner outreach, including three public uh, owner meetings in Harlem and individual property owner meetings at our offices, LPC received widespread support for the district. At our public hearing on April 17th and in written testimony, the commission received support from 28 organizations and individuals, including representatives of the Office of New York State Senator Brian Benjamin, New York State Assemblywoman Inez Dickens, the Office of Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, Manhattan Community Board 10, the New York City Landmarks Conservancy, the Real Estate Board of New York, Historic Districts Council, the Municipal Arts Society of New York, Society for the Architecture of the City, Landmark West, Save Harlem Now, Ascendant Neighborhood Development, the West 131st Street and the West 132nd Street Block Associations, Mount Morris Park Community Improvement Association, New Amsterdam Musical Association, local property owners and local residents. As I mentioned, LPC heard some testimony at our public hearing uh, requesting that the boundaries be changed to remove the former stable from the district and also received a petition with over 450 signatures asking the commission to keep the boundaries as proposed, including the former stable. The Landmarks Commission voted unanimously to designate the historic district based on its architectural significance and the incredible, incredibly significant cultural history it embodies and to retain the original boundaries, including the garage. We are very pleased to bring this designation before you today. In the interest of time, I only highlighted a few of the culturally significant buildings in the district and I urge you to look at the story map that the LPC released in conjunction with the designation to read about all the others. Thank you and I am happy to take your questions. Thank you very much and uh, I would like to thank um, uh, the LPC for your thoughtful consideration of this, of this designation and for that extensive history lesson that you just provided <laughs> to us today. Uh, it, it is appreciated and, um, you know, uh, as an African American, I can certainly appreciate all of the deep history that is held in this particular historic district and it is absolutely uh, a pleasure um, to consider this designation before us today. Um, Councilmember Barron, did you have questions? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And just want to make note, I want to give credit to my predecessor, former Council Member Charles Barron, who insisted that the Landmarks Commission in all of their presentations find what contributions and significance areas had to in the African American and to the development of the city at large and make sure to include that. So I want to give that recognition and commend you for the presentation that you've done. I just have a couple of questions. Uh, we talked, in part of your testimony, I heard you indicate that you carved out those buildings uh, that were significantly changed from the original design. Did you show in your dra drawings that some of those that were in yellow or some color were we carved didn't, out? We didn't actually carve those out. We did note that there were some alterations, but overall, it, we, the area is very much intact. There are a few new buildings, which we noted, um, but those really maintain a similar scale 
and use of similar materials so they don't detract from the overall character. So are there any new constructions within the boundaries that you propose? Yes, and they are these, sorry, I'll just go back really quickly. Maybe they show here, no, I show here. So on this right. we show um, the new buildings look like the one that you see in the middle of this slide. Okay. So they're new, they're not in context, but they are, are included in the boundaries. They're included in the boundaries. They, they aren't really thought of as intrusions the way we would new construction that's out of scale. Um, but since they are um, of a similar material and scale, you know, they, they work with the streetscape. Okay, so then my question comes to the garage and former stable that you had in your presentation where the owner requested a carve out. What is involved in um, agreeing to have a carve out and what consideration was given to that property? Um, let me just find the map that shows it. So the, the I'm always concerned that the city doesn't, you know, overlook the individual, the small person, you know, the person who has some concerns and address their issues satisfactorily. So what consideration was given? What would be required to designate it, or to take it out of the designated area? It's located at the uh, western edge of 132nd Street, okay. which you can see here in orange right. at that top. Yeah. Um, so what would be required is to So it's the orange rectangle in the upper left? That's right. Okay. Yep. Um, but we analyzed, I mean, we met with the owners on a different, uh, two different occasions and had extensive conversations about their concerns um, and talked about what it means to be in a district, what type of changes may be permissible for their building. Um, being in a historic district doesn't mean that you can't do anything to your building. It, it means that the commission would have to review and approve proposed changes which may be able to include um, an expansion of the building. Um, or, but in this case, we did additional research really to analyze its place within the streetscape, its place within the history of the district, its architectural design and materials which relate to the rest of the historic buildings in the district. And then the commission found that it was contributing and voted to keep it in the district. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Um, I also uh, echo uh, concerns of my colleague, and, I, and you know this, um, for this particular um, parking garage, the former stable, um, I would like to hear all sides, if they're uh, all sides uh, relevant to this particular property that is now attached to this de designation. So I, uh, for the record, am reserving um, any feeling or, or anything. I want to hear all sides because I know that there are some that want it and there are some that don't want it. So I am ready and uh, excited to hear both sides um, of this story for inclusion or non-inclusion or leaving in or carving out this particular property. So thank you very much, panel. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I am told that we do have members of the public who wish to testify on this item. So I'd like to call up Jordan Press. Uh, Jeff, is it Burroughs? And Jason Jackson. You will have two minutes on the clock. We've got a few panels coming up today, so in the interest of time, you will be time limited for your testimony. 
on the end. Okay, I'm going to ask council to swear you in at this time. Please state your names. Uh, Jeff Burroughs. Jordan Press. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answer to all sub, uh, council member questions? Yes. yes. Thank you very much for being here today. You may begin. There we go, Kenya, thank you. Uh, I own a sound company too, I should know this. <laughs> thank you, council members, for the opportunity to speak today. My name's Bentley Meeker, and I own the garage in question at 161 West 132nd Street, the very northwest edge of the central Harlem Historic District. I'm here to request that the city council exclude my building from this historic district, and the reason why, um, I'll come out with a little later. Um, I'm a longstanding East Harlem resident, uh, I was a West Harlem resident for a long time. I've been involved with the community in Harlem for over a decade. I collaborated with Community Board 9, the Department of Transportation, the 125th Street BID, and the West Harlem Arts Fund to create a large-scale public art installation on 125th Street and 2nd Avenue, 12th Avenue, called The H in Harlem. Um, I love Harlem. I've chosen it as my residence because I really believe uh, that it is the most vibrant and vital part of New York. It's where I raised my son, and it's where I wanted to, uh, I wanted him to, to be a part of this community for my entire life in New York. Uh, I do applaud the LPC for designating the Central, Central Harlem Historic District, whose special architecture and cultural history are a remarkable reminder of the powerful role that the African American community of Harlem played in creating political, social, and cultural change both in New York City and indeed the nation as a whole. But my garage is clearly distinctive from the residential row house buildings that characterize this district. My garage is located right across the street from a new construction building that was not included in the district, and the decision by the LPC to leave the properties along Adam Clayton Powell and Lenox Avenues out of the proposed district was purposeful and begs the question, why were those commercial properties excluded, yet this commercial property designated? The special sense of place that the LPC is creating with this district will be just as intact if my property were not a part of it. My building is different from the vast majorities of buildings in the district in both typology and use. My parking garage is the only commercial building in the district and it was built, am I running out of time here? <laughs> Sorry guys. And it was built as a stable that was converted into an auto garage. The, um, the building has been altered at the base and the entire facade is obscured by heavy black paint, which was noted earlier. Furthermore, it's been damaged by decades of automobile exhaust and road salt, which damages the asphalt, rebar, and floor structures. The wood framing of this building makes it impossible to repurpose and eternally preserving a wood-framed parking garage simply doesn't make any sense either on an economic or on a social level. I have no immediate plans to redevelop this building, but. We were before city planning to explore possibilities when the historic district was proposed and city planning ceased all planning with us until this is resolved. It's patently unfair for the city to preclude me from options with my property in the future by landmarking this nondescript parking garage. And it doesn't make any sense to keep a, uh, a parking garage frozen in amber forever. I understand the Landmarks Preservation Commission does not regulate use, but designating my property is an effect relegating my property to remain in a garage in perpetuity. So, I guess I gotta cut this short. Um, anyways, I just wanted to, I appreciate the opportunity to testify for you guys. Um, I really believe that this is, uh, this is, this building has a lot of merit outside of the, um, outside of the historic district and makes a, a lot of sense for the city to keep out. Um, Thank you, Mr. Meeker. Uh, I guess my, my question uh, for you is just to get a, a little bit of an understanding um, with regard uh, to this garage. Um, you stated that you had no immediate plans to redevelop the building, 
but were exploring possibilities when this was proposed, when this historic district was proposed. What exactly are your intentions, if any, for this property? Um, well, so the reason why I've got uh, Jason and Jeff with me is because we uh, are in discussions right now. So one of the things that we were talking about doing was putting a residential property up and then have the bottom space be a community facility. The community facility would be more, because I'm in the arts and because I came up through the arts, I wanted to do an arts-based facility there. Um, so I've got Jason, I've got Jeff, I also have a friend of mine who's a cultural curator over at the Metropolitan Museum of Art who programmed a lot of their uh, sort of uh, live performance uh, type stuff. And we were going to put a, uh, we're talking in deep discussions about putting a community-based facility there. We wanted to do the St. Nick's Pub, um, but <laughs> unfortunately that's not something that we could do now. Uh, but we were knee-deep in discussions, Jason and I were knee-deep in discussions with them. We thought it was a little bit small, and that's where the whole discussion of the parking garage came in, because St. Nick's was, a, you know, certainly culturally significant, but when we went in there and actually looked at the space, it was very, very small and very difficult to manage in terms of ADA compliance and in terms of zoning and, and regulatory aspects of it. But uh, because, you know, it had been closed for a long, long time, but it was, a, it was a great idea. I loved that idea. I wanted to have that idea take a life, and so we, we decided that maybe this would be something that we would use in a, a development uh, on 132nd Street. Okay, that, that's reasonable. There seems to be no real prohibition of change in this building um, if, it's, if it's included in this designation, though. How, in your, your view of uh, perhaps changing it, how tall of a building, how big of a space are you, were you thinking of? Um, so, I, 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 again, we were in the, phys in the feasibility process. I don't think that zoning allows us to go very high in that neighborhood. Um, I do think that repurposing the existing building is something that's impossible. First of all, there are light and air requirements that it's in violation of, so any, any residence that I would do would force me to, to, to be compliant with light and air. That would mean that I'd have to chop the last 35 feet of the building off, but the building's made out of wood. There's no way that the building would structure itself would actually withstand that. So if we were going to do anything, anything other than turn this thing into a parking garage, we would have to take this thing apart and we'd have to put it back, we'd have to put a new property in its place. And that's why we want to take it out, because I can't, it, we lose money every month as a parking garage, and it doesn't make any sense for this thing to be a parking garage forever. Mm -hmm. Especially given self-driving cars are coming out now, and da 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 you know. It's so a whole I different world for parking, and I'm noticing it actually in the way that we're, you know, in our transient activity. So I guess it's safe for us to, to not assume, but pretty much to understand the fact that regardless, you do plan to change this building, this property into something other than a garage? I mean, we, we would have to, we have to, you know, it's. Okay, and as, as far as changing the structure to um, perhaps uh, housing, would you guarantee that this would be affordable housing for the residents? Absolutely, affordable, so affordable housing was a big component of what we were looking at when we were doing this whole feasibility study. Again, we don't know what we're able to do and what we're not able to do because we haven't completed the feasibility, and city and city planning won't talk to us until we until we have a uh, you know until we have the all clear, but absolutely affordable housing uh, you know certainly a component of potentially completely affordable housing was something that we were looking at and something that we're very earnestly pursuing. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague for questions at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for coming before this committee. Thank you. And. If, in fact, your property remains uh, in the boundaries that have been proposed, my understanding through city planning is that you could not make major changes to the facade. But what you can do on the interior is not impacted. I think that's... Understood. The, the nature of the construction of the building itself is such that the interior, it's, it's basically a wood, it's a wood-framed building. So if we were going to take that building and convert it, build on top of it, if we were going to, you know, if we were going to turn it into any kind of a residence or any kind of a commercial facility, the structure itself just wouldn't, it, I, we just couldn't, we couldn't do it. We just can't do it. I mean, I've had architects look at this thing. I've had, I've had zoning people look at this thing. And we've, we've done some, we've done some real homework on this. And so it's a garage now? It's is all the parking now. on the lower level or is, are there parking? Parking on every level. 
Say again? Parking on every level, including On every shower. level. Yes. So it's a building that can sustain cars on every level, but can't be adapted to other kinds of uses? No. Oh, I'm not an architect, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I'll I'll I'm not an architect either, but I thought architects right. sell it. It seems yeah. a little weird to me, but I I'll talk a little to weird my to me. friends I'm not gonna lie. that are architects, to me too. and I'm sure that they'll give me the reasons that that uh, is the case. Yeah. Um, so in your testimony, in your written testimony here, you indicate that uh, you're losing a significant amount of money every month. So how long have you owned this business? 11 years. 11 years. Please don't judge my acumen as a businessman on this deal. <laughs> Say again? Please don't judge my acumen as a business person on this deal. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. So 11 years. And um, has it... Has it been the trend that it's been losing money, or is a significant? It's, it's been losing money from day one. Uh, I've been noticing a drop in my transient business because a lot of people, not so much self-driving, but because of Uber and ride-sharing, Lyft, Juno, and stuff like that. So we've been we've been noticing that the ride-sharing community has been taking a lot of our transient business away. Okay, and then I have another question. Um, you talk about the possibilities of what could be. And you say those plans could include new housing with affordable housing and a community art space, uh, which you're in discussion with your colleagues. And of course, you say you would be in consultation with local stakeholders. So wouldn't that, in fact, then mean that that present structure would have to be demolished? I mean, I don't see how the present structure survives. But uh, you know we're open to. Here's the thing: we're open to looking at, and we're open to talking to everybody, uh, both at the community level, at the block level, right. you know, at the council level. So, if the community said, uh, "Well, we will support housing," if in fact there were your your establishment were carved out, and the community uh, said, "Okay, we will support housing at that location that is six stories high, so that we don't get burdened with a tower." that inhibits our light and our air and our sunshine. Would you agree to that? I would have to do some more research and understand it. I mean, it's, uh, you know, certainly uh, uh, on the surface sounds okay to me because I don't think that we're going to have a lot more opportunity than that to go much higher than that. But I, I don't know. I don't know what the opportunity cost of that would be. I don't know what the expense to build inventory at that level would be. You know, we, again, there's a, a lot of, a lot of, variables that go into figuring out what, what can be done and what should be done with a property like this that we haven't been able to pursue because of what's been happening. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. I, I just had a couple, of, a couple of other questions for you, Mr. Meeker. Have you had any conversation with LPC specifically on what would be allowable under the landmark designation? Um, we we have had discussions with them. I don't know. We, we haven't gotten a definitive answer of what would and would not be allowable. I, I, I almost wonder if, and I haven't dealt with them a whole lot, but I almost wonder if it might make more sense in a situation like that for us to come up with a plan. And, and, and I, I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. Okay. But they have not given us any indication of what we would or would not be able to do, as far as I understand. And I do own a building in another historic district. If I want to change my doorknob, it's a year and a lot of headache. Okay, so there has been no meeting specifically around what you can do here. Um, my, my last question on this is, does uh, any other developer have an interest in this property? No, I own this building out and out solely and 100%, well, except for the bank, clear. Okay, all right, thank you. Did anyone else want to say anything? Okay. If, could we deliver testimony? Could we deliver testimony? Yes. Sure. Hello to the council. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm here to speak in opposition to the landmarking of the parking garage at 161 West 131st, 132nd. I'm a Harlem resident. I was born and raised not in this particular district, um, but I've seen Harlem change over the years. Um, I may look young, but I'm not. <laughs> I support new development and investment in the community, and uh, I've learned a lot in this process. Um, and landmarking this garage isn't really beneficial to, th to that end. Um, and obviously, the LPC did a great job in explaining 
the, uh, the political and cultural relevance of the district. Um, I actually think they left out a couple. They didn't mention Romare Bearden or Jacob Lawrence, uh, but neither of those had work hanging in this garage. Um, so I don't, I don't think, I don't think landmarking this is, is going to uh, protect the cultural legacy uh, of that particular district. Uh, if it's not landmarked, I believe it has the potential to one day become something that can actually be useful in the, in the community. And that's the discussions I was having with Mr. Meeker uh, around the time that this happened. Uh, before then, as he mentioned, we had been talking about um, taking over the St. Nick's Pub and renovating it. Um, and there's a uh, great gentleman who owns it, challenging, but great man. <laughs> And uh, obviously he's had some issues with it of late and we hope he gets that together. But this has been an ongoing conversation for us on how we can sort of protect the cultural legacy uh, of what Harlem represents. I work in the arts, I have all my life from the music and uh, music business and hip hop and R&B to producing theater uh, to also now producing film. So it's something I'm committed to professionally as well as personally. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Hey, uh, my name is Jeff Burrows. I am uh, also a, good, a friend of Bentley for a long time and um, have uh, various business transactions with Mr. Meeker. West 132nd Street is a beautiful historic street. The proponents of this landmarking action should be commended for bringing their efforts to the council. While most of this designation is appropriate, the inclusion of the parking garage at the western edge of the district should be reconsidered and should be eliminated in the final resolution the council makes. There are community needs that must continue to be addressed in Harlem including adding to our housing stock, supporting community-based organizations, providing retail opportunities. We should not preclude alternate options like these by designating this nondescript and antique parking garage within the historic district. Further, our community embraces the use of mass transit and alternative transit such as bicycles, which the council should accept and promote rather than preserving a dirty old parking garage. I uh, agree with what Mr. Jackson said about um, the ability to create um, exciting spaces for the arts. I have a 25 year career in the music business as well as in television and, and film business and we look forward to the possibility of creating something special there. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Jordan Press. I'm a senior vice president at Constantinople and Balone Consulting and I'm submitting this testimony on behalf of the owner of 161 West 132nd Street in connection with the proposed Central Harlem uh, West 130th to 132nd Street Historic District. I'll submit the rest of my uh, testimony for the record and just wanted to focus on um, one point which came up in, in your questions, um, that including this property within the proposed Historic District would have the, pr the practical effect of locking in the non-conforming parking garage use within the existing building. The non-conforming use provisions in the zoning resolution are intended to phase out non-conforming uses, allowing their replacement with conforming uses consistent with the surrounding development. However, conversion of the existing building to residential use is infeasible due to requirements for light and air in residential units. The nearly full lot coverage building cannot accommodate required legal windows except on the West 132nd Street frontage. The existing building's approximately 6,000 square foot floor plates cannot be configured for tip typical residential layouts because the existing building is too deep. As a result, conversion of the existing building to residential use would re require significant renovation. Based on our preliminary engineering report, given the building's age and structural condition, the work required to convert the existing building is significant and would be cost prohibitive. In addition to the structural concerns regarding potential conversion of the existing building, any residential occupancy would also potentially require signi significant environmental remediation from the decades of parking garage use. Therefore, should 161 West 132nd Street be included in the district, it would essentially preclude the owner's ability to establish conforming residential use in the future. Finally, and as was noted earlier, 161 West 132nd is at the northwestern edge of the proposed district with no intervening buildings between this property and the proposed boundary line. So we would respectfully request the uh, subcommittee's uh, exclusion of this property from the boundaries of the historic district. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your testimony today. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh.
sorry, 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 panel. We do have another question from Councilmember Barron. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Press. Good to see you again. See you. In your testimony, uh, you talk about the restrictions for the present building being used or converted to be residential use. And you give the conditions in terms of light and air. Yes. But isn't it true that if this were uh, not a part of the designated area for landmark, that the present owner or new owner could apply to the city for uh, exemptions to whatever the zoning currently is and get special consideration to build a tower or a residence there? Isn't that true that that could happen? The, the process to get a, sh should it be included in the, designa in the designation, if I'm understanding your, your let, me, let me try and then I'll, and then I'll if I'm understanding your question properly, mm -hmm. if it were to be included within the designation, but then um, we No, were, if it were not included, if it were carved out, if we responded positively to your request yes. that it not be a part of the boundaries, yes. then if a new owner or the present owner in the future decided that, well, you know, I'm not restricted because it's not a part of the boundaries and I'm going to build residence here, isn't it true that that new owner, without the restrictions of being in the boundaries of the landmark, can put up a residence? Because your testimony talks about the existing building. And I'm thinking forward. Right. If a new building came up, right. that it could, in fact, be there, be a height, and get special permits from the city to be able to do what is not allowed presently. So the only way that could be done uh, would be through, I mean, there, there's, there's the existing zoning, which it would have to right. be conforming to. Right. And then, but I mean, the you, existing zoning can always be changed. That would have to go through a full right. rezoning, right. including the community review process and we'd have right. to come back to this to this body right um, which um, it, you know enable I mean that that's all discretionary to the community and to the council right okay if that change were to occur in the future okay thank you we're, you we're not here to, to ask for that today <laughs> yet <laughs> thank you Well, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, panel. Thank you, Councilmember Barron, for reading my mind. All right, we'd like to invite the next panel, Orlando Rodriguez, former Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, Andrea Goldwyn, New York Landmarks Conservancy, Simeon Branch, his Bancroft, sorry, Historic Districts Council, and Liz Volchuk, the Municipal Art Society of New York. Thank you. Please state your name for the record and council will swear you in afterwards. Uh, Orlando Rodriguez, it's Borough President's Office. Uh, Liz Volchuk, uh, on behalf of the Municipal Art Society. Simeon Bank of Office, Historic District Council. Andrea Goldwyn, Landmark Conservancy. Is that on? Was that on when you said your name? It wasn't. No, I'll, I'll say it again if you want. Uh, Orlando Rodriguez for the Borough President's Office. Liz Volchuk, on behalf of the Municipal Art Society. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. Okay, you may begin. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Adams and uh, members of the council and subcommittee on landmarks, public siting, and maritime uses. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. Uh, in 
and I'm here to express support for the designation of the Central Harlem West 130th to 132nd Street Historic District. Uh, the Borough President wholeheartedly supports the designation of this proposed district, which holds tremendous social, cultural, and political significance in the history of our city and our nation. The approximately 164 buildings in the proposed district serve as a visual reminder of the leadership of Harlem's African com American community in affecting social and political change in the 20th century. Indeed, among the beautiful row houses in the proposed district are several important institutional buildings, including the headquarters for the New Amsterdam Musical Association and the Alpha Physical Culture Club. The former utopian neighborhood clubhouse designed by African-American architect Werner Woodson Tandy served as the planning headquarters for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963, as was previously stated. In addition, the proposed district also exhibits obvious architectural merit. Uh, and that was all articul uh, articulated earlier by the LPC presenters, so I won't reiterate. Um, but I, I will get to the, the heart of why the borough president sent me in to testify today. And that is related to the previous uh, panel um, and the, the owners of the garage at 161 132nd Street. In the borough president's opinion, the garage site completes the cultural and architectural narrative of the district. Um, there's really no legitimate basis, and I didn't hear one today, uh, for why the owner's request to be removed from the district should be uh, favored. Removing it from the boundaries LPC set forth would flout the purpose of historical district designation. Our historic districts serve to protect our city's history against market forces and property owners' whims. Excluding this site from the historic district would endanger the integrity of the mid-block on which it sits. All historic districts have boundaries, and the fact that this building is historically intact makes it well-suited to remain in the district. Underrepresented communities have long had to fight for landmark status and historical district designations, and now is not the time to whittle away at the edges of this important achievement. The Central Harlem West 130th through 132nd Street Historic District would do much to memorialize and protect the multifaceted legacy of Harlem and its effect on the history of this city and this country. The Borough President thanks the works of the Landmark Preservation Commission, the tireless efforts of Community Board 10, and local advocacy groups like Save Harlem Now in moving this forward and she urges this subcommittee to vote, to, de to vote favorably for the designation of this historic district with the boundaries the LPC designated in their final decision. Thank you. Thank you, and we thank the borough president. Good afternoon. The Municipal Art Society of New York supports the designation of the Central Harlem West 130th, 132nd Streets Historic District. The proposed district is only one of many historic areas of Harlem that should be recognized with landmark status. Like many neighbors and preservation advocates in the Harlem community, MAS would like to see more dis district des designations in Harlem before entire neighborhoods are lost to inappropriate and out of scale development. The proposed West 130th and 132nd Streets Historic District includes many distinctive brick and brownstone row houses that define the residential character of this low-density neighborhood. But it is not only the diversity and refinement of the neo grec Renaissance Revival, and Queen Anne-style homes that what makes this district notable and worthy of designation. Like other sections of Harlem lacking protection, this area is also culturally significant as a primarily middle-class African-American neighborhood. Since the early 20th century, many prominent African-American clergy, prof professors, doctors, activists, and artists have lived on the blocks encompass encompassed by the proposed district. The cultural significance of the proposed district extends beyond the artistic associations. In 1963, activist Bayard Rustin organized the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom from an office on 170 West 130th Street. 
The march is credited with encouraging the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting, Voting Act, Rights Act of 1965. The fact that its headquarters were on this block makes the proposed district even more significant on the national level. MES believes that this historic district warrants the protection uh, of Landmarks Preservation Commission. We encourage the continuation of working with Community Board 10 and Safe Harlem now to designate other significant districts in Central Harlem. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Simeon Bankoff Historic Districts Council. HGC is thrilled that this uh, designation is moving forward. Uh, I have longer testimony, but I think that it, we really have spoken quite a bit about the cultural importance of this area as well as, frankly, its physical beauty. I'd like to take a few moments, however, to talk specifically about the garage building, um, which is very much of a piece with the, with the existing historic district. Um, the creation of boundaries of a, of a historic district is an incredibly difficult and fraught topic. We often don't actually agree with the Landmarks Commission's final feelings about those boundaries and often feel that they should actually be wider. With that being said, this is not the forum to really suggest that they should be wider, which they should be, uh, because all of Harlem is so very important both to the city and to the nation as an area, and, and much of what is said about this area can be said beyond the confines of this very small district. However, um, Harlem is deeply, deeply underprotected. Uh, with regard to its historic resources. Um, this is a, an issue that has been evident for decades and has been working on for decades, and this is a great first step um, for trying to redress that problem. To whittle away, in the words of Gail Brewer, with the, um, of the boundaries would be, in addition to being unfair to the, to the work of the LPC, really unfair to the community, uh, especially when listening earlier to, uh, to the owner, and was talking about wanting to work with the community on a new development at that site. Landmarks works with the community every single week on new development within historic districts. There was recently, in fact, um, a garage building on Hanson Place in bed that was converted into residences, having worked with that block association on a uh, design that was much better than the one originally proposed. So we say that please to keep this building within it Development will come, may come to the site, but if so, the community should have a strong seat at the table for that. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Adams. I'm Andrea Goldwyn speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. We're pleased to support designation of the Central Harlem West 130th to 132nd Street Historic District. The blocks of this district are a handsome collection of buildings. The row houses from the late 19th century are largely brownstones in the neo grec Queen Anne, or Renaissance Revival styles. The district also contains several other building types of the same era, including apartment flats buildings and the historic stable, now garage, under discussion, which maintain the same scale and similar stylistic elements as the row houses. Institutional and religious structures include the current home of the Friendship Baptist Church, built in 1883. While there have been some alterations among the properties, uh, the buildings within the boundaries discussed today are mostly the same scale, height, and volume as when built, with substantial historic fabric, materials, and details intact. Uh, we have heard a lot about the history of this uh, community, and our written testimony goes into it a little bit more. But uh, for time's sake, I'll just recommend or uh, reinforce the recommendation that everyone listening check out the Landmarks Commission's website, which uh, has an exceptional resource of information about this district. The story map connects visual resources and compelling stories. The information conveys the remarkable history of the district that's inextricably tied to its architecture. The Conservancy looks forward to working with all of the owners and offering the services of our Historic Properties Fund, Technical Services staff, and Sacred Sites program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you. I'd like to invite the next panel. Valerie Jo Bradlin, Safe Harlem Now. Sedaria, is it Crestfield? 
Mount Morris Park Community Improvement Association. Angel Ayo. Ayon. Save Harlem now. C. Rachel LaRock. LaRock. West, West 132nd Street Block Association. Can you all please state your names for the record and then council will swear you in. Valerie Jill Bradley. Rachel Lecoq. Siberia Asbury Crestville. Angel Ayon. Please raise your right hand. What? Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? Yes. Yes. You may begin. Good afternoon, members of council. My name is Valerie Bradley, and I'm president of Save Harlem Now, which is a membership not-for-profit organization, advocacy organization, dedicated to protecting, preserving, and celebrating Harlem's irreplaceable built heritage. Our advocacy is not merely limited to saving individual outstanding structures, but also works to preserve contextual buildings, landscapes, and other elements that contribute to define Harlem's sense of place and special character. Our collaboration efforts are aimed at enriching Harlem's quality of life through continuity with the past while enhancing awareness of our local economy. We at Save Harlem now wholeheartedly supported the designation of the Central uh, Harlem West 130th to 132nd Street Historic District. This district is one of our, out of eight historic districts the Community Board 10 and Save Harlem now submitted to the Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, for consideration in Central Harlem along with eight proposed individual landmarks and one proposed interior landmark. Uh, we are glad that our collaboration with LPC has led us to this juncture and we look forward to continuing to work with the commission and our local partners to designate the rest of the proposed landmarks in CB10 as well as others that are being proposed throughout Harlem. With regard to the designated historic district, district that you are considering today, we strongly believe that altering the boundaries would set a dangerous precedent for this and future districts in Harlem. There is an owner of a garage property who you just heard from on West 132nd Street who is most likely anticipating submitting a land use application for an upzoning in the future. The Landmarks Preservation Commission has already outlined why the garage on the West 132nd Street should be kept in the district. We would like to add that it makes no sense to alter the boundaries of the district to accommodate one property owner when the majority of the homeowners on the block, as well as homeowners on 131st and 130th Streets, want the district to remain intact. We know and you know that a rezoning would most likely include demolition and a new structure that does not match the footprint of the rest of the block, such as actions, such actions defeat the purpose of creating a historic district. We regret that the former Lafayette Theater, the natural anchor and namesake of the proposed district did not survive the wrecking ball and absent landmark, landmark protections was demolished like many other Harlem treasures. Despite the absence of the theater, the designated historic district includes a largely intact group of late 19th century buildings in a neighborhood that has played an outsized role in the cultural, political, and social history of New York and the United States. Just one more paragraph. 
we urge you not to alter the boundaries of the district, which would almost guarantee that the stable turn garage will suffer the same fate as the Lafayette Theater. Please stand with the homeowners and the residents of 130th, 131st, and 132nd Streets and vote to recommend the West 130th to 132nd Street Historic District as indicated by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Harlem deserves additional landmark protections immediately. Otherwise, the ongoing real estate development pressures and resultant gentrification will irreversibly compromise the integrity of Harlem as one of the most significant neighborhoods in America. We depend on you to protect us from the development pressures that destroy what makes us special and unique. Help us save Harlem now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Adams and subcommittee members. My name is Rachel Lecoq, and I thank you for the opportunity to address this committee today. As the president of the West 132nd Street Block Association, I am here to voice our complete support for the Central Harlem Historic District, along with the boundaries set forth by the Landmark Preservation Commission. I'm going to use my time today to not rehash, I think, a wonderful job that many of our our colleagues in this room have um, presented, and I'm going to focus instead really on the sentiments of those who live in the district and the larger um, community that supports us. Our block is thrilled to be included in this culturally rich and historically significant district. At all public information sessions and public hearings to date, there's been overwhelming support for this district. Our block is a historical snapshot of the development and evolution of Harlem. On our block, you will find a variety of structures, including an operational church that is actually originally was a church next to the garage, former stables, townhouses, new construction, apartment buildings, and an NYC Parks designated garden, all of which are important to the district and worthy of landmark status. There is discussion regarding the inclusion of 161 West 132nd Street. The residents of this district and the larger Harlem community support the inclusion of this building. This building is completely located within the mid-block of West 132nd Street and is in direct view of numerous townhouses on the south side of the street. This building is similar in stature to the buildings found along the northwest portion of our block, specifically 151, 153, 151, 149, 135. These buildings are near identical in height and width, and cumulatively, they represent a sizable portion of the block and define the northwest streetscape of this district. These other large buildings serve a variety of uses. All are either owned by the city or nonprofits. They are rent stabilized, affordable housing, shelter, or transitional housing. All of these other larger structures on our block, uh, we absolutely feel should remain within the district. Removal of any of these buildings would compromise not only our block, but the district as a whole. To start excluding buildings now would set a dangerous precedent for this district. The current makeup of our block is a wonderful example how buildings of many different uses have a place within historic districts. The landmark district status does not dictate the use of a building. It doesn't force the change of a use and it doesn't dispel, um, and the owners of the building continue to operate as they do today or change their use as they desire. Specifically pertaining to the stables, New York City provides many examples of landmark stables that have been repurposed and converting into schools, including a school on the Upper West Side for special need and autistic children, and high-end condos uh, in the uh, lower end of Manhattan. As a block, we, rep we respect the rights of all property owners within the district to change or expand their buildings per zoning and other governing regulations, including the LPC requirements. The foundation of this historic district is not simply the individual buildings, but rather the cohesion of all the buildings. Although the structures on our block are quite different, they cohesively fit together to architecturally and historically tell a poignant history of Harlem and civil rights in America. I have spoken to Regina Smith, the president of the West 130th Street Block Association, along with Lloyd Williams, the president of the 131st Street Block Association, and I can confirm that as of this weekend, all three block associations are united in support for keeping 161 West 132nd Street within the boundaries of the district. We applaud the work of the Landmark and Preservation Commission in so thoroughly documenting both the architectural and cultural significance of this district. We believe their work presents 
indisputable evidence support the designation of this boundaries. And we ask that you support us as well. And I would just like to add a final comment that when you look at the map, you will see that this building is indeed in the block. It is in the mid block of this proposed district. If you allow them to be removed, they will reap all the benefits of being within a historic district. They will have the maintained streetscape without any of the um, adherence to the landmark um, uh, rules and it's really kind of granting them a free pass and so we feel very strongly that whatever they choose to do with their building we would like to work with them we would like to support them but we absolutely feel strongly that it should remain within the historic district thank you very much for your time thank you good afternoon chair Adams and the City Council Committee the Mount Morris Park Community Improvement Association would like to recommend the approval of the designation of the Central Harlem West 130th to 132nd Streets Historic District without shrinking the boundaries of the designation. This would include building 161 West 132nd Street as a part of the historic district. Shamefully, fewer than 5% of the buildings in Harlem are landmarked. If you've walked three blocks in either direction of the proposed area, you will find comparable buildings to the ones being considered and I wish the designation could be larger. As a longtime Harlem resident, we purchased our brownstone 30 years ago near the Mount Morris Historic District. We rallied as a community and were granted an extension of the district in 2015. Historic districts being, I'm sorry, historic districts bring economic value to New York City that go beyond higher home prices. Historic landmarks can be tourist destinations bringing outside dollars into a neighborhood. They promote a sense of community and can attract stable businesses which bring in more tax dollars, allowing for great public investment in infrastructure and services. The designation of the Central Harlem Historic District is culturally significant and there is an architectural heritage that has survived here. Home to the African American owned Lafayette Theater, the area was occupied by artists, directors, dancers, actors, stage professionals, and other cultural institutions. The area was also home to many pastors that founded churches in the neighborhood. There were so many pastors on 131st Street, it was known as Pastors Row. On such a few short blocks, you had a myriad of influential artists, doctors, composers, pastors, funeral directors, musicians, civil rights activists, and other professionals. W once these blocks are landmarked, they will come back to life and contribute to the economic stability of the neighborhood. Lastly, building 161 West 132nd Street must not be excluded in the historical des designation. As a formal stable, it rounds out the history of the neighborhood and should not be destroyed. Thank you. Hello, Chair Adams. My name is Angel Ayon. I would like to thank the New York City Council Subcommittee um, for taking another step towards protecting Harlem's unique architectural and cultural legacy. As Vice President of Safe Harlem Now, a former Harlem resident and preservation advocate, I would like to express my unequivocal support for the proposed 130th to 132nd Street Historic District in Harlem, as designated by the New York City Landmass Preservation Commission. Landmarks in Central Harlem, where there is no shortage of both architectural merit and cultural significance, account only to less than 6% of the area, or 30 to 50 landmarks per square mile. This metric is extremely low when compared to other areas downtown, such as the Upper and West Sides, Greenwich Village, Tribeca, and Lower Manhattan. Up to 50% or more of these neighborhoods are designated properties at a rate of 50 to 100 landmarks per square mile. This imbalance is what, for too long, has led to the, to the misperception in Harlem that landmark status is a privilege that only wealthier com communities downtown can attain and afford. Additional landmark designations in central Harlem, like the proposed 130th to 132nd Street Historic District, will help to address this imbalance. But as you know, landmark designations are not awarded as a matter of equity, but to protect historic resources. Like many other neighborhoods in New York City, Harlem has undergone a profound tra transformation during the last few years. The ever-growing real estate pressures in Harlem and its resulting effect, gentrification, are not incidental. 
they are the result, among other reasons, of inappropriate zoning. In the presence of inappropriate zoning, which Safe Harlem now hopes to revert, landmarks designation is not only a recognition of architectural character and cultural significance, it is also the most effective regulatory mechanism to afford Central Harlem with real protections of its historic character. I encourage the members of the subcommittee to ratify the, the district as designated by uh, LPC without excluding any building from the proposed boundaries included in the LPC designation. In case it is not clear, the owner of a uh, property uh, at, 161, at 161 West 132nd Street have allocated significant resources to retain lobbies to persuade both the community board, the community uh, and the elected officials that their corner property, which they plan to redevelop, is not worthy of preservation. Excluding another law from the proposed historic district boundaries will certainly lead to another outsized and out of context development that will, ha will have a serious impact on the character and scale of the proposed historic district. Please uh, ratify the Central Harlem, uh, Central Harlem West 130th, 132nd Street Historic District as designated by LPC. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for testifying today. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to invite the next panel. Michael Henry Adams, Sherry Culpepper, and Antoinette Hamlin. Someone has not filled out a slip. I read three names. I invited her up. She's actually not going to speak, but Okay, will all of you please state your name for the record and council will swear you in. Michael Henry Adams. Sherry Culpepper. Leah Culpepper. Antoinette Hamlin um, from New Amsterdam Musical Association. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. You may begin. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, council members and Chair Adams. My name is Michael Henry Adams, and uh, 17 years ago I came here through the auspices of council member Bill Perkins, and the council presented me with a proclamation recognizing my book, Harlem Lost and Found, an Architectural and Social History, 1765 to 1915. And unfortunately, in the intervening years, things have gone wildly awry because the council was recognizing the work that I'd done to document the architectural heritage of the community that I live in. And since that time, uh, so many of the buildings depicted in my book that still survived have been destroyed, including um, more than a dozen of the 30 churches that I included in that book. Uh, fewer than 5% of the buildings in Harlem are protected by landmarking versus two-thirds of the buildings in Greenwich Village. So here we are today faced with the ultimate African-American paradox. We're offered too little, too late, and even then we're asked to cut it down. And this is really an appalling thing. An answer to the owner of the stable and something that I think that you all should do is go online and look at the Bradhurst Stable Condominium at number 458 West 146th Street. That building is a former stable building 
built at about the same time as this building with approximately the same square footage. It's a narrower building, slightly higher. This building is now a condominium selling some of the most valuable apartments in Harlem for a million dollars and up per apartment. And that's not necessarily what we want to have happen at this other location, but the idea that you can have an historic building and that it can't be retrofitted and redeveloped to make something else is just insane. If you look at PS, if you look at PS 170 on 145th Street, which was a public school building that was falling down and with trees growing through the roof for over 30 years, that building is now 100% affordable housing with a boys and girls club of Harlem in it. So you can do whatever you want to do. It's merely to have the will to think that our heritage, our building, our culture in Harlem of African-American people is valuable and useful and worth protecting too. There are plenty of people in New York who if they could would not abide by the building codes or the fire codes. Landmarking is just as important because it protects and recognizes the contributions of all of the people who've helped to make New York great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon. I, my name is Sherry Culpepper. This is my daughter, Bria. We are fourth and fifth generation Harlemites. My great grandparents moved on 132nd Street in 1935. And I am here today uh, kind of in limbo as to this landmarking because what I recognize very often happens is small landlords get hit with a lot of uh, specialty fees in maintaining and doing construction. Uh, at the same time, I know I, I am proud to, to be a Harlemite. Uh, my, my grandfather, great-grandfather, was actually the accountant for Marcus Garvey, and we very often, the building was used as a meeting place for the UNIA. Uh, one block away, my great-uncle was a choreographer who got uh, calls from uh, Fred Astaire. So I've always been proud to, to be a Harlemite, and I am actually, uh, on another level, fighting a lot of laws that were passed, and, and uh, the city council, it sounded like a good idea to do certain things in that area, and then all of a sudden, um, small landlords get hit with violations through the roof. Uh, so my question is, I did a little research, very often when you finally do designate an area as landmark, it then takes 20 years to actually put it into place. My question is what happens uh, during that time period and will there be any uh, wait grants? Will there be any waivers for small landlords that have to keep their building to a certain um, standard because of the landmark uh, designation? Uh, and that is my main concern. Yeah, the, the designation, I, I thought I was going a little loopy, but I'm, I'm right. The designation is immediately affected. May, may I just not, say it's not, that the It's not 20 years or, or, or anything. That designation, that landmarking designation is in effect immediately. Might I just say in answer to her question though that the Landmarks Conservancy and even the Landmarks Preservation Commission, they do have a small grants program in addition to which there's the federal and the New York State investment tax credit available only to landmark buildings. Now, of course it's not free to be landmarked, but it isn't free, you're, you're required by the building codes of New York to maintain your buildings at a minimum standard even now without being landmarked. With all due respect, I'm not talking about maintaining um, a building. I'm talking about, uh, like, if you want to change your windows, uh, if you want to make certain exterior changes, there's going to be a cost. And I know how uh, people in New York can take advantage of certain situations. So you will have um, contractors that will now automatically triple to do certain work because it is landmarked. Okay, no we're, go we're going to stop you there. Hello, hello, we're going to stop you there. Okay. Okay. Mr. Adams, Ms. Culpepper, we have yes. members of LPC right here to address you when we, uh, when we terminate this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, 
My name is Antoinette Hamlin. I'm president of New Amsterdam New Musical Association. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about the organization. Uh, NAMA was established in 1904, incorporated in 1905. It's a non-profit organization created by black musicians who were excluded from the American Federation of Musicians, Local 310, which is now 802, and it's because of segregation. NAMA became a key cultural reference point for jazz music during the Harlem Renaissance from the 1920s through the 1950s, where such notable as U.B. Blake or Jelly Roll Morton came through. Today, NAMA remains the oldest African-American musical association in the nation. The organization supports the musical and artistry projects of its members, locals, and neighborhood residents. It also provides space for recreational services, community events, including their teaching programs, learning programs, Monday night jam sessions, jazz art, Friday night jam sessions. We just developed the Queer Weeks Musical Scholarship Program for children seeking training in instrument. The last Sunday of March, NAMA hosts a tribute to legendary vocalists for Women's History Month. The ladies bring their sounds of those grand dames of song back to life and also feature some of today's new singers. Our mission statement vows to voluntarily promote and encourage the study and production of instrumental music in various forms. We want to draw together trained musicians in the state of New York in all musical forms of education and encouragement. The administrative and financial abilities of NAMA are coordinated by the volunteer efforts of a small group of its members who all have professional skills uh, in that area. That terrific team works diligently together to, on fundraising efforts that include building renovation funds, which is an ambitious plan. Um, our offices are located at 107 West 130th Street, NAMA sponsors and supports year-round programming that is educational, entertaining, and suitable for visitors of all age. In addition to continuing its mission to assemble, train, and encourage music, musicians, each NAMA member is also committed to the well-being of seniors, the education of youth, and the development of important life and professional skills for adults. We are happy to be included in the Central Harlem, West 130th Street to 132nd Street Historical District. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you all. Okay, we'll invite the final panel of the day, Roberta Washington. Zanarina Stewart. <coughs> and if there's anyone else that wish to testify today, please fill out a slip as this is our final panel on this matter. Okay, will you please state your names for the record and council will swear you in. Roberta Washington. Zendrina Stewart of NAMA. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and then answer to all council member questions? I do. Thank you very much, you may begin. I have lived on my block on West 132nd Street for 25 years. I was very supported, supportive of the designations of neighboring better known areas of Harlem, such as Strivers Row and Mount Morris Park as historic districts, but always felt that more of Harlem's neighborhoods deserved to be designated. As such, I was absolutely thrilled that my block 
is to be included in the designated proposed to find out that my block was to be included in the designated proposed historic district of our own. A designation that highlights our district as one equally rich in culture, historical, and architectural merit. It is a district with many intact brownstones designed by architects who were well known at the time in colors and hues that are recognizable as a New York signature. But in our district, some symmetry of buildings is occasionally interrupted by time and life. While most of the housing in the district is intact townhouses, several of the townhouses were built within the last 15 years. Some lots within the proposed district contained apartment buildings, affordable housing and shelter and transitional housing. And there are also churches, stables, which became a garage and a New York City Park designated garden, all of which are important to the district in creating an authentic historic snapshot of the development of Harlem. Typical of the change associated with New York, the buildings constructed were constructed for others, but by the turn of the century were inhabited by middle-class African-Americans who had moved from other parts of Manhattan. Uh, by the 1920s, it was solid black middle-class neighborhood, which attracted, as you heard before, actors, artists, ministers, physicians, among others. The district was the home of the first all-black athletic club in the United States and of the ragtime uh, Joplin, Scott Joplin, um, among others. It's also a place and a base for a lot of the um, social activities and social movements that um, were national and not just limited to our city. Um, the residents of the proposed district welcomed the garage located down the street from my house on West 132nd Street as an innate part of our district. Although we understand that the space can be developed as something other than what it currently is, we see that lot and that building as an important piece of the history of our district and of such, as such, believe that it should be recognized within the district. Although the structures are varied, they all cohesively fit together to architecturally and culturally tell our story, our history of that part of Harlem and civil rights in America. At all the public information sessions I attended, uh, both uh, in, in Harlem and at LPC, um, the majority of my neighbors and I overwhelmingly gave support enthusiastically to the district. And at the same time, um, we called for this and other areas to be landmarked. But there was also a call for the borders as currently delineated to be maintained. And I urge the city council to support the designation of the Central Harlem Historic District with the boundaries as currently proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Washington. Um, I'd also like to call up at this time uh, Willie Mack to join this panel. Okay, Mr. Mack, please uh, state your name for the record. Uh, Willie Mack. Please raise your right hand. I'm sorry? Please raise your right hand. Oh, yes. <laughs> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay, um, this is uh, personal to me. Anyway, my name is Willie Mack, and I'm chairman of the board of NAMA. Um, I... Uh, was introduced to NAMA in 1968 at a playground in Harlem. And um, now I'm actually, um, it's, it's personal. A person spoke to my friend who was practicing his saxophone with me, said, he, well, he actually played something that I never heard before. And I said, well, where did you get that from? And he said, Mrs. Seals, Gladys Seals at NAMA. And so that's how I began to be associated with NAMA. And I've seen what they've done over those maybe 50 years. And I've seen the struggles that they've gone through, and I've seen many changes you know, within the organization. But the one thing that they've waited for 
was what's happening now. You know, the landmark status, that's always been in the background. The group of people that are running, uh, Ms. Uh, Hamlin who just spoke, actually were the main forces behind this, uh, uh, the making of, of, of what is, has come to fruition now, the status of landmark. So it pains me to feel that you know, we have to wait even longer uh, because of one building. Um, so that's what I'm saying is personal. Um, the other thing is that in addition to teaching of the historical part of it is, is so outstanding. You know, people like James Reese Europe, who was our first musical director. Um, Will Marion Cook of Broadway fame. Uh, Yubi Blake, of course. All these people, you know, were part of NAMA. They were NAMA members. In 1903, to just back up a little bit, there were just a group of musicians at an apartment on, 150, on 54th Street, actually, that, as Mrs. Hamlin mentioned earlier, were excluded from the white union. So they put their heads together, you know, to maintain, to establish working conditions for themselves. Just Two years later, in 1905, the New Amsterdam Musical Association was incorporated. That only took two years, right? So in my head, I'm saying, wow, it's, it, has taken two, it took two years for that. Then why is it taking so long for this? You know, that's what I'm thinking. Why is it taking so long for us to, to have the status of landmark, you know, that not only NAMA, but so many other buildings and organizations in the community, you know, deserve. That kind of thing is, is going on. So that's why I say that I s completely support, you know, the designation as it is with the boundaries, all right? Um, and, um, Lastly, I, I just want to thank you, you know, for, you know, your efforts in moving forward with, you know, laying mark status of 130th, 131st, 132nd Street. And uh, the only other thing I want to mention, and even though I had something prepared, I'm speaking from the heart, from the heart I grew up in 19 West 118th Street. And I took a ride by there a couple of years ago just to see the building that I lived in. It's no longer there. There's no 19 West 118th Street anymore. It just it merged with 21 and 17, that kind of thing. Well, it's not my, it wasn't my building, and, you know, that's, that's something that happened. But when I saw that, I can't tell you how my heart sank, because I couldn't even see the number on the building that I used to live in, that kind of thing. And I, I you know, that's why I'm so, you know, pleased you know, and so fully support, you know, the landmark status with the designations as they are, without any changes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Thank you, Council. Um, I'm from the New Amsterdam Musical Association. Myself, I'm the treasurer. My name is Andrina Stewart, and this is also personal for me as well, because I did not prepare anything, but I just wanted to say how 
I feel very honored to be part of this landmark or time that we're having right now for the 135th, 34th, no, sorry, 130th, 132nd, and 30th Street. Um, it's, it's an amazing honor to be a part of this and, I, and be a part of NAMR as a whole. I hope everyone in here gets a chance to come out to NAMR and experience as well. Um, I, I don't know what else to say because I'm a little nervous, but thank you once again for the, this honor that we are being opposed and being a part of this community. My mother and my father both Harlemites. My mother was born in Harlem Hospital. So for me, a person who lives in Queens, to come out here, every, come out to Harlem every week to, to experience it is just amazing. Now Harlem is part of my home as well. Even though I'm not living there, I do live there. I live there every Saturday, every Monday. I'm always there because my heart belongs to Harlem as well. Don't tell Queens. Don't tell Queens. Don't tell Queens. And that's it. I'm very short and sweet. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Stewart, you. fellow Queens it. resident of mine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, panelists. I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Are there any other members of the public that wish to testify at this time? Seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this item, and that concludes our public hearings for today. I'd like to thank the members of the public, all of you, uh, my colleagues, council, um, uh, land use staff, for attending today's hearing, for all of your help. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned. Mm -hmm.